Hi, welcome to General Chemistry 2. My name is Chuck White and today's lesson is on liquid solutions. We're going to talk about ideal solutions of solvents and solutes and we'll talk about Raoul's law of vapor pressures for uh, combinations of uh, solvents and solutes. We'll talk about the free energy of solutions and then we'll talk about three colligative properties. The first is freezing point depression, then boiling point elevation, and finally osmotic pressure. So let's begin by considering an ideal solution of two gases. In an ideal mixture, uh, in a mixture of ideal gases, the presence of one gas has no effect on the other. They're mostly independent because most of the time gas molecules are just flying through free space and only every once in a while collect, uh, collide with another molecule and bounce off and go in another direction. So the total pressure is equal to the sum of partial pressures of the two gases and the partial pressure of each gas is proportional to its mole fraction according to the ideal gas law. So in an ideal solution of two liquids, uh, just as the activity of an ideal, ideal gas is equal to its partial pressure in bars, the activity of an ideal liquid is equal to its mole fraction, and each liquid must be in equilibrium with its own vapor pressure. The partial pressure of each gas is then proportional to the mole fraction of that component in solution. So PA is equal to XA times the equilibrium partial pressure of the pure liquid, and the total uh, pressure of the mixture of two gases is just XA PA times XA XB PB. So let's take a look at the, a graph of this behavior. Um, by analogy to gases, the Gibbs free energy of one component of an ideal solution is given by the delta G of formation of that component is equal to the, to the delta G zero of formation. That would be under standard conditions, which would be the pure liquid or, or mole fraction of one, plus a correction term RT log X, where X is the mole fraction of that component. So reducing the mole fraction of component A causes a proportionate reduction in the partial pressure of A above the solution. And so if we look at the red uh, dashed curve, the partial pressure of A above the solution will go from the normal vapor pressure of A at XA equals 1 down to 0 at XA equals uh, 0. And the same thing only in reverse for the partial pressure of component B. And so when we add the partial pressures of components A and B, then we get a linear dependence of the total pressure that goes from the ordinary vapor pressure of B, for pure B, to the ordinary vapor pressure of um, A at pure A, and linearly every, everywhere in between. Now, although most gases exhibit nearly ideal behavior at low pressure and moderate temperatures, non-ideal behavior of solutions is much more common because molecules in solution spend a lot of time right next to each other colliding and, and uh, encountering each other. And so the um, intermolecular interactions are going to have much more influence on the thermodynamic activity. The Gibbs free energy of each component, uh, A and B, can be determined from the vapor pressures above the solution. This is a very powerful concept because um, each uh, component in the liquid solution must be in equilibrium with its own vapor, and we can determine the thermodynamic uh, activity of the vapor and therefore the um, Gibbs free energy of the vapor and if that equilibrium occurs then the vapor is in equilibrium with the li with the liquid and the delta G uh, must between those two phases must be zero and so we can use the vapor phase uh, data to determine what the delta G is in the liquid phase and so we can observe in this case positive deviations from ideal behavior uh, which are caused by uh, the solution phase interactions. And so you can see that the pressure, the partial pressure of each component is greater than what, what would be predicted for an ideal uh, liquid. And uh, so uh, we can really detect the non-ideal behavior of solutions by looking, for example, with a mass spectrometer at the components of the vapor phase by itself. 
Now we turn to colligative properties and the first colligative property that we're going to consider is the freezing point depression. If pure solid B, in this case um, ice, is in equilibrium with a solution of A and B, that is to say in this example salt water, then the chemical potential of the solution component B, uh, the water component in, in solution, is reduced compared with the pure uh, liquid. And that means that a lower temperature is required to keep the solid ice from melting completely. And uh, so we can take advantage of this reduction of the chemical potential in the solution phase water relative to the pure ice uh, to describe a freezing point depression. Now the freezing point depression constant for water is 1.86 kilogram kelvins per mole and what that says is that the uh, freezing point depression, the delta T um, in the freezing point, is equal to the freezing point depression constant times the molality of the water in uh, moles per kilogram solvent. Now we can actually calculate the freezing point depression constant from, uh, con from uh, uh, thermodynamic values and it turns out that uh, this is the gas const constant R times the square of the melting point in, in kelvins times the molecular weight of um, the uh, water divided by a thousand which um, converts the molecular uh, weight to kilograms per mole and uh, the delta H of fusion in SI units and notice that all of the inputs for the freezing point depression constant are independent of the solute. There's nothing here that says there's any difference between sodium chloride or um, sucrose, for example, for uh, freezing point depression. So the freezing point depression constant depends only on uh, the properties of the solvent and not the solute. Similarly, for the boiling point elevation in a solution of solute A and solvent B, the chemical potential of the solvent is reduced compared with the pure liquid. And uh, so a higher temperature is required to reach the, the boiling point of B, the water. And so uh, similarly, the delta T in the boiling point is equal to the Kb, uh, the, the boiling point elevation constant, times the molality of the uh, solvent, in this case the salt, in the water. Uh, but the uh, boiling point elevation constant, uh, Kb, depends only on the properties of the water and is independent of the solute to a good approximation. So uh, now we turn to osmotic pressure. And in a closed system, uh, the reduced chemical potential of the solvent in the solution on the right hand side causes the pressure to rise as pure solvent migrates in. The water uh, wants to have the same chemical potential on the left uh, as on the right, uh, but the only way it can do that is to increase the pressure on the right. And so that osmotic pressure is equal to uh, the number of moles of solute times R times T divided by uh, the volume. And so Na over V is the concentration in moles per liter, for example. And so um, pi is equal to uh, nRT over V, which looks sort of like the ideal gas equation, but in this case we're concerned with the osmotic pressure rather than the partial pressure of a gas. In reverse osmosis, an external pressure is applied to the solution on the right, making um, uh, and forces it through the membrane, and as long as we apply a pressure that's greater than the osmotic pressure, we can actually generate pure water on the left. And this is the way that reverse osmosis water purification uh, devices work, for example. So in summary, with colligative properties, the colligative properties of a solvent, the freezing point depression, the boiling point elevation, and the osmotic pressure, all depend on the concentration of the solute, the molality, or the molarity in the case of osmotic pressure, but not very strongly on the properties of the solute. Uh, so for example, uh, dissolving sucrose or vinegar in water at equal concentrations gives us about the same freezing point depression because Kf depends mostly on the properties of the water.
The exception actually is with strong electrolytes like sodium chloride, which produce um, two or more times the normal concentration. So this Van't Hoff factor, as it's called for sodium chloride, is two because for every mole of sodium chloride that dissolves in water, you actually produce two moles of ions. And we already said that the colligative properties really don't depend on whether it's sodium plus ions or Cl minus anions. Uh, so you've really doubled uh, the the uh, uh, colligative property effect by using a salt. Next time we will talk about uh, equilibria involving acids and bases.